Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening to me, and thank you very much for these nice words of introduction, Annette Mills. Thank you very much, Mr. Oberauer, for this wonderful conference, whose first day has been a great success and has been very inspiring. Why don't we give a big applause to Mr. Oberauer, the conference organizer. Thank you. Now, let me also talk about the prize winners, my colleagues, my former colleagues, Regina, Sven Afbrück, and others that will receive prizes. Let me say congratulations to all of you. After all, this is what uh, we have come here for. So congratulations, Sven. From the I to the we, why is the future so promising? This is the topic that I've selected myself. Now, is the future really this promising? Well, let me put things into perspective a little bit. It depends on how we perceive times in which we live. Do we keep abreast of our times? Are we a child? Are we children of our times? Or do we look back? Do we live in a time warp? And do we not catch up? Well, good times are ahead of us if we embrace our difficult times with open arms. Let's not delude ourselves. Just maintaining the status quo, says Emmanuel Macron, will not actually help us maintain status quo, but will self-destroy us. Maintaining the status quo will not maintain the status quo. It brings about self-destruction. He talked about the Fifth Republic, and he also talked about Europe when he said that. So if you uh, stand still, you don't make progress. But this is also true for our industry. If you just preserve the status quo, you will end up not attaining the status quo. So time has changed us. There has been fast-paced technological change. I'm not going to talk about this tonight. Uh, many people are saying technology is the answer. But I say, well, what's the question? Now, the topic that we uh, are addressing with our readers has nothing to do with technology. Recently, I was invited to dinner. Steve Bannon was there. Well, my old friends uh, working for Spiegel are mad at me for having accepted the invitation. In Zurich, Roger Köppel from Weltwoche had invited us. Eight or nine people came together in the Park Hyatt Hotel. A lot of drinking took place. Well, this is quite usual among journalists. The only person who didn't drink was Steve Bannon. And he was asked, so how, do you, how did you explain the election result? Because Trump had trailed Hillary Clinton and the Democrats in general. And he said, well, he came to the 26th floor of the Trump Tower. That's where the campaign HQ was located. And he looked at the schedule, at Trump's schedule for the next months. And uh, we know this from our companies. It was about target groups, you know, a talk in the South and the North, and uh, something for the steel workers, something for the Wall Street, something for intellectuals, and then a little bit about disability policy, older women, white people, black people, ugly people, nice looking people, a lot of claims, uh, a whole script. And then Bannon said, well, we were trailing. I uh, tore those pieces of paper. I talked about it with Donald. And we then agreed on a single sentence. We just let go of this. We're not going to focus on PR and on target groups and on, well, targeting the demographic. We're dealing with something else. Let Trump be Trump. And at the time, as we know, this was quite a courageous thing to say. For many of us, this was terrible. Well, that's when things started. Look, Hillary should go to jail and many other terrible things that this candidate said. But this struck a responsive chord, and that also led to his election result because the public appreciated authenticity more than the established party system in the US. They didn't vote for him. They just didn't vote for Hillary, who had been uh, put under a lot of pressure by Bernie Sanders, who actually uh, was a nonpartisan candidate. Actually, it's two nonpartisan candidates that 
were uh, vying for the president's job in the largest democracy in the world. Well, you all know in Austria, when um, presumed outsiders win the game, Macron showed that this doesn't just work from the right, but also from the left. He didn't use a party, uh, but he set up his own movement. So what am I saying here to the media people? The public's moving away from the well-trodden paths from established powers, the powers that be. They don't really care if it's the media or the political parties or yesterday's authorities of any way, shape, or form. Let Trump be Trump. Well, this strikes a responsive chord because it's not just the super egos that are successful, but also run-of-the-mill people. John and Jane, well, they're saying, let John be John, let Jane be Jane, and let Mr. Miller be Mr. Miller, and let the CEOs be CEOs. So uh, the citizenry has uh, shown some self-empowerment. Now, the period of enlightenment did not take from 1650 to 1800. No, the age of enlightenment is actually an ongoing process. People want to feel themselves. They want to use instruments, the instruments of power. They want to get hold of those instruments. That's what we're seeing in politics, and we journalists describe this every day. This has to do a lot with us. Mainstream media has been mentioned, as well as old and entrenched parties or the legacy media. Well, we are also addressed here at least some of us. So we need to interact with our readers and please interact with them as early as possible before Donald comes here and dismantles or converts the media industry in a not very democratic manner. Now our readers, our citizens, they have bid farewell to the old powers. They want to be a power themselves. Editors-in-chief, well, they have a great job in the old world. They had a great job in the old world, high above the uh, editorial desk at the Georg von Holzbing School of Journalism. Uh, we were told above the editor-in-chief, there's just the sky, or uh, editor. the editor-in-chief is uh, the crown of our creation. That's what our professors told us. And um, editors-in-chief were like that. Today, they're different. Citizens, readers, voters, well, it's the same people. And these people want to overcome old powers in every industry across the board. Just look at what's going on. And I'm trying to explain this to you. While the citizens out there, they have ushered in an era of revolution. Well, it's not called revolution because it's going on quite silently without the ingredients of revolution, no bloodshed, no hanging, no guillotines, no beheadings. But the banks are not disappropriated in Germany. They're just regulated. But it boils down to the same thing. Nuclear energy. Well, citizens didn't want nuclear power. So it, the power plants were just dismantled. Well, they were just uh, shut down without any parliamentary decisions. Merkel was just a notary public of the silent revolution because the public said we don't want nuclear power. The food industry, well, under our noses, it's retrained. Vegans, vegetarians, and other health nuts are responsible for this. Well, Nestle is not looking to the parliament, but to NGOs, the chat rooms, young people. The food industry is being transformed. So there are courageous, um, confident citizens. It's not just the women's movement, the consumers' movement. It's also a revolution involving readers. Now, we might lose some readers, or our interactions become loose. But this has nothing to do with technology. This is my proposition. This has to do with something else. Technology shows to people and empowers people how they can actually harness their power and convert it. Influencers, bloggers that make their statements know over and above the classical media, they have a lot of significance. They have more significance. Sasha Lobo also talked 
uh, about this, and he has more power. He has more Twitter followers than the editors in chief. Let me just also mention the chancellor and the parties. They don't have many followers either. So normal run of the mill readers, they don't want to be the subjects of Ms. Merkel or some established parties or of the editors in chief. They want to enter a dialogue. They want them to be taken seriously as citizens, as partners, rather than a target group. And I believe that while we talk about the future and think about the future, and we've heard about conversion rates, paid content, and many other encouraging things, but we need to, of course, also test things. What we're dealing with here is readers who look as if they have remained the same. Well, it's the same people, the same faces, the same clothes, but people now think differently from the way they thought 20, 10 or 20 years ago. They have different demands and expectations. They're concentric circles. So you've got the super egos and politics, and we also need them in journalism, but then you've got readers, too, that also have their egos. It's concentric circles that uh, meet and that are also in conflict with each other. But both, of course, are things pertaining to the same overall phenomenon. So my message to editors-in-chief and other senior officials is uh, be independent, be curious, analyze things, be uh, gutsy, be very articulate, but also be curious. You should know what your readers actually think. You should also be able not just to preach and to write pieces. You should also learn what you might have forgotten, learn how to listen, how to communicate, learn how to take your readers seriously. So you shouldn't just watch them uh, based on surveys or focus groups or cookies. Learn to live with your readers as if it were a true partnership. So. Thanks to new technologies, these ties have become much closer. And with this in mind, I would say, well, we have very good times ahead of us, just like other industries. We should take people seriously. This is important for democracies. This is also important for the banks, the utility companies. This is the only approach that we have, because that will allow us to uh, marry confidence and the future. Otherwise. We just run away from citizens. We uh, stand still and we move away from the citizens. So with this in mind, I think we can be quite confident when it comes to talking about business models and when it also comes to talk when it comes to talk about our target groups. What do we do? What we do? What we do? It, do it for? Over and above business plans, revenue streams. Well, that of course will be merged. So um, people that come to a Rolling Stones concert will also buy merchandise articles. But of course, uh, you need to have a lot of people in order to make money. And this is something that we need to do, too. So we often forget this in these technological times. Albert Camus, the humanist philosopher, said something nice. And I think it's quite a fitting thing. He said, don't run after me. Maybe I'm not a leader. Don't run ahead of me because I'm not a follower. Just run next to me and be my friend. Thank you.